776-7710 gets you on board the program, and I'm joined now by U.S. Senator Roy Blunt, Republican, Missouri. Senator, how are you this morning? Great. Good to be with you. I talk to you a lot from uh, the car and uh, on the way to work in uh, Washington, but I uh, like, like it when I come by and see you at the studio. Yeah, we got a much better connection today. Uh, better I, connection. I appreciate that. I, I want to start off with why you're here in town today. Now, you're going to be meeting with some small business people about the problems of Obamacare and trying to implement this into your business. What, what are you going to right. talk to well, them about? Right. Well, both here and uh, in St. Joseph Dam, I'm going to be talking to people about uh, how hard this is going to be to implement the um, trend in the country now toward part-time employees, uh, the greatest move in retail ever toward part-time employees. 288,000 people entered the part-time roles in April. Uh, and um, the people, by the way, that lost maybe a full-time job but stayed part-time still showed that they were employed. But why are they going to part-time? Because the government, for the first time ever, has said, here's the level at which you have to do something, which by definition means if people work less than 30 hours, as an employer, you really don't have any obligation to do what maybe you've been doing for 50 years as an employer because you thought it was the right thing to do. I think we're really looking at uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle are saying things like Max Bacchus, a train wreck, uh, mm -hmm. Rockefeller, the most complicated piece of legislation uh, ever uh, passed in the, by the federal government, uh, Gene Shaheen, all three Democrats. I really think small business people are going to have a lot of problems with this. I think what those of us like you and I who have opposed this from the beginning have been saying is going to turn out to be uh, way beyond true. It's yeah. going to be probably we've underestimated the negative impact on the economy and on families. That's the thing that's got me is that all the all the times we, we've said that people like us were lying. Well, every day new stuff comes out that shows we were the ones telling you the truth. Yeah, I remember you we said they had this act on this deal yeah. on long-term care called the Class Act that, mm -hmm. that I said and others. I was on the Commerce Committee at the time that had the health care jury that this will not work. There's no way this will work. Well, about two years ago, Kathleen Sebelius said this will not work. We're not even right. going to try to do this. Right. And, and it was one of the reasons. That, gone up, right. down. And it was one of the reasons people voted for this long term care. That sounds like a good thing to be able to insure yourself against. The small business plans that were supposed to be available January 1 when the law starts, no longer, not going to be available now until at least January 1, 2014. I mean, 15, not 2014. So. Well, even some of the things that everybody thinks is great, like keeping your kid on your insurance until you're 26. Well, a lot of these companies are doing now is just saying, then we're not going to insure kids at all. You know, we can't afford to keep doing this until your kid's 26, so our policy is not going to include kids. There's a lot of them Well, and you know, that. apparently you don't, get any, you don't get any credit for providing insurance for families and benefits. And if your spouse, if your husband's on your insurance from work and he's at work another place and, and doesn't take their insurance, they get the blame for him not taking the insurance. Right. And, and it's, it is a, it is a, it's going to really destroy so much of the health care system we've had rather than taking a system that wasn't perfect and making it better we've taken a really good system and we're clearly on the way to making it worse yeah Rand paul is pointing out 10 beyond the 2000 page bill law now 10,000 pages of new regulations that have been created by the bureaucrats to outline how to do this. Well, actually, Rand Paul's uh, a good friend of mine. He's only half right here. It's 22,000 pages. It's really? seven and a half feet tall, higher yeah. than that door over there in the studio, which is six eight. So it would have gone just about to the ceiling of this room. Man. And by the way, you know, all those rules, if, if you people were upset because nobody had read the 2,000 page bill that voted for it, and I didn't read it all either, but I didn't have to read much to know I wasn't going to vote for it. Uh, the, the 20,000 pages of regulations weren't all done by the same person. So I'm sure if you pull out a regulation like two foot up in that seven foot stack and comply with it, probably three feet higher, there's a regulation that you're suddenly out of compliance with and nobody's going to know it until, until somebody come comes in and says, wait a minute, you violated the five and a half foot level re regulation. Absolutely. We're talking with Senator Roy Blunt here, uh, KCMO Morning Show. All right, let's get into some of these other scandal things. It turns out now Eric Holder had said over the weekend, uh, excuse me, it came out over the weekend, that Eric Holder personally approved that uh, warrant that his people put together in the Department of Justice to go after James Rosen under the Espionage Act. He had said in front of Representative Hank Johnson at the congressional hearing, in regard to potential prosecution of the press for the disclosure of material, this is not something I've ever been involved in, heard of, or would think would be wise policy. 
He said for the Espionage Act of 1917, you got a long way to go to try to prosecute the press for publication of material. In other words, he was trying to say, I don't know how we got this far. I sure wouldn't have done it. It sure looks like he lied to Congress. How, how else can you say, this is not something I've ever been involved in, heard of, or would think would be wise policy? Even the Huffington Post and Esquire now say he should resign. What do you say about Eric Holder? Well, I think it's higher than Eric Holder. I think that, you know, Eric Holder doesn't appear to have any idea what's going on in the government. Uh, the, the, President Obama doesn't appear to have any idea what's going on in the government. Uh, I think the reporting to the White House from the IRS that got at least as high as the uh, chief of staff, even though they immediately said the White House counsel found out and didn't tell anybody, I didn't believe that. In fact, I was on television that day um, on, I believe it was uh, MSNBC, saying I will be shocked if either that person is not fired by the end of the day for not telling the chief of staff or we don't find out in the next couple of days that, of course, the chief of staff knew. I think it's higher than Eric Holder. Uh, you know, Eric Holder, is, neither Eric Holder or the president appear to be able to control the job that they've been given. And even Jay Carney said the other day, well, you know, the federal government is too big and too complex for the president to know what's going on. I thought that's what you've been saying on your show for quite a while. It's what I've been saying. If that's true, too big. let's let the state government do what it's supposed to do and local government do what it's supposed to do and get the federal government to where it knows what it's doing rather than the spokesman for the president says, just way too complicated for us to know. It's just ridiculous. Uh, but, Senator, what people want to know is, I know what my listeners have been asking is, so so what happens to these people? I mean, if Eric Holder lied to Congress here, and he was under oath, they put him under oath for this, then heads should roll. If, if, if President Obama's chief of staff didn't tell him, why is he there? If, if he did tell them, then why are we being lied to? I mean, all the way down from the IRS to the AP to Fox News Channel to Benghazi to Fast and Furious, all these things that have been chipping away at the credibility of the government that really undermines the entire system of government. If we can't trust our government, if we can't trust that the IRS isn't going to politically target us, if we can't trust all these things, then the whole experiment falls apart. Then, then what do we do to fix it, and what do we do to root out the problem? Right. This looks like a systemic thing. This doesn't look like a one-off deal. And, and the question is, is it? It's systemic incompetence, or is it systemic? Is it a systemic effort to uh, to try to take rights away from the American people and politicize uh, everything? You know, when this uh, Miller guy at the IRS uh, clearly misled Congress. Uh, once I saw the questions that were asked and the answers he gave, I, I called for him to resign as one of the very first people to do that or to be fired. Um, Eric Holder, if if he knew what he was talking about, that's one thing. He ought to be he ought to he ought to be dismissed from that job if he truly lied to Congress. My guess is there's at least a chance that he may have signed something that he didn't even know what was in it. But that's bad too. That would be total incompetence. Uh, so like you said, either he's a bumbling idiot or he's lying. I think that's that's sort of the underlying question about all this: is the IRS full of ninety thousand people who don't know what they're doing? Or is it full of 90,000 people who do know what they're doing and they're doing bad things? You know, what, what do you think of the idea of a lot of people have been putting forth this, that Obama didn't pick up the phone and say, hey, harass the Tea Party. But, you know, he'd been given speeches about how bad the Tea Party was and about how these 504C deals were bad. He went, he, he chastised the Supreme Court in a uh, State of the Union address over right. that decision, right? He, he comes out and calls Fox News the enemy, basically, and says they're not really a legitimate news source. I mean, all the entities that he and his organization have kind of denigrated are the ones that were targeted by these other parts of his government. So, I mean, it does come from the top. The tone comes from the top. The tone, the tone comes some, from the top. Yeah. The tone comes from the top. There is no question about it. But, you know, people, if they would wanted to, could have found out that when he criticized the Supreme Court at the State of the Union before the Supreme Court, his criticism wasn't even accurate. Right. And he still got reelected. This is the frustrating thing for you. It's the frustrating thing for me. He did get reelected, uh, and uh, uh, people are now getting the government that they should have known they were going to get. Uh, he was very forthcoming about criticizing people who were making large contributions to groups that weren't for him. I remember, there was this business guy in Idaho that uh, gave a pretty substantial amount of money. Vandersloot. Uh, Vandersloot. Yeah. And, and the president goes on record immediately saying he has a, a sketchy background or he has some background that's highly questionable. He suddenly got investigated by everybody. Yeah, IRS, labor, everybody was there. Turned out a year later he didn't. they couldn't find a single thing. But the president of the United States said this guy who he may or may not have had any idea who he really was, but since he was opposed to the president... Oh, he's highly questionable. 
And then three audits, do you think three audits occur just coincidentally? And he'd never been audited in 30 years yeah. of business. Just coincidentally, three yeah. people, three federal agencies show up at the same time. You've got the EPA flying around the middle of the country in drones over feedlots, and this guy admitted to me the other day in a hearing, well, we're not really spying on people, but we are spying on cattle. So the, the government is now at the business of spying on cattle. <laughs> right. Just craziness. Man, oh, man. Senator Roy Blunt with me here on the KCMO Morning Show. Let me get to uh, uh, Senator McCain in Syria because, uh, you know, a lot of my listeners, again, are saying, look, we, we kind of got involved in Egypt, didn't go so well, really. When we look at the aftermath now with the Muslim Brotherhood and everything uh, in Libya, still not looking so good. Are we going to do this thing again in Syria? And Senator McCain, I know he means well. But going to talk to these rebels, many of them have actually said on the record, we're aligning ourselves with al-Qaeda. We don't even know who the good guys and the bad guys are here. What do you think our role is in getting involved with this? Well, I think the problem with our policy here is now we've waited so long that this is a much harder mess to sort out than it would have been a year and a half ago or two years ago. Lots of people have died. Uh, Assad appears at this moment to be able to reassert himself. He has weathered some of the international criticism and probably figured out that the international community... Uh, starting with the United States, appears not willing to do anything. Uh, and uh, trying to figure out now who you deal with, who in the last two years have been looking for people who were going to encourage them, and they were often bad people that are not our friends and allies. Uh, I, you know, so what would you do if, you're in, if you were totally in charge here? What would you do with that situation? It's, it's hard to say because I, I would have hoped I would have thought of something to do at a time when it might have been more helpful. Now you've got a real tangled um, mess to try to get in and figure out, okay, is there anybody here who we can really help? Is there anybody here we can arm? Uh, I think uh, one of the best things to do is to create a no-fly zone, which does minimize, if not eliminate, Bashar Assad's real advantage, which is the ability to put uh, planes in the air and drop things on people and shoot at people and spy on people from the air, uh, that's something we could do without uh, putting American lives at risk, but I'd also do everything I could uh, to figure out where the weapons that we know he has, back in a chemical weapons discussion, but we know he has them. We believe he's probably used them. you, you can't you can't draw a so-called red line like the president did and then just keep moving not doing anything about it. Yeah, it's a bunch of it, money cartoons. It hurts, your, over this it hurts your credibility everywhere else in the world, not just in Syria. I know you got to run. I just wanted to get to this because there are people who say, but what is our? Why do we care? And now, no, why do we care? Because we care about people dying. But where's the American interest? Because there are people dying all over the world, and there's all kinds of conflicts, and we don't get into all of them, and nor should we, right? So, so why is the American concern such that we should do a no-fly zone? I think our biggest uh, concern in the world right now should be Iran and nuclear weapons in Iran, uh, and Syria has become a puppet state of Iran. It, spread, it, it spreads the Iranian influence. Uh, by the way, while they're doing all this and we can't even figure out how to put some planes in the air that would not put us at risk, the Iranians are clearly moving closer and closer to the capacity to have a, a nuclear weapon. And if there is a, a lesson to be learned in North Korea, the lesson is not as applicable maybe there as it is in a much more dangerous part of the world, the Middle East, we're about to see an irresponsible government get in a position where it too can begin to blackmail the world uh, if uh, on whether it develops a nuclear weapon or not, whether it then develops a delivery system or not. this And, and Iran and Syria is all part of that a tangled web of Iranian influence in the Middle East, and so is Lebanon. And, uh, you know, I'm not in charge, so I don't have to decide today, but if I had been in charge, I would have decided something long ago that would have tried to shift the balance there so Assad would have to leave while you could still have a government that really uh, was not going to be uh, dominated by Iran, not going to be dominated uh, by uh, Islamic radicals, but uh, dominated by uh, people who actually had the goals of, um, of freedom and uh, a free society. All right. Well, listen, we appreciate the time, and thanks for being in here today. We'll talk with you again real soon. Great to be here. I look forward to talking to you soon. All the best. 